Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is Palm Sunday, April 14th. The Reverend John H. Pollock. to the Mount of Olives, 
Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of me, and immediately you will find a donkey tied to him, a pole with her, and tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, saying to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt of the foal of the beast of her. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You would take your palm cross. O Lord God Almighty, please bless these palm crosses and the people who bear them, that you would be praised in your name be glorified. As we trace the journey of Jesus into Jerusalem and ultimately to the cross and empty tomb, remind us that through the holy acts you have opened the door for us to everlasting life. Amen.
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of the donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from river to the end of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from 1 John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward you. That is, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we ask that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As it goes again without difficulty, please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to, do good, to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask you? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. A couple of announcements to share with you. First of all, our thanks to those who were here yesterday, both men and women, who cleaned the sanctuary from front to back. Um, they cleaned everything, the pews and everything. Uh, one thing, request that comes out of their cleaning is they found an awful lot of Kleenex and gum underneath the pew cushion. Please do not put your Kleenex, use Kleenex or your gum underneath the pew cushion. Uh, it took them quite a time to get those uh, that gum off. So uh, thanks again to those people who helped. Also a reminder of Holy Week, we have special services Monday, Thursday, Good Friday at 1.30 and 6.30. I still need a leader uh, for the 1.30 Good Friday service and the 1.30 Monday, Thursday service. Okay, never mind, I don't need a reader. Thank you. Uh, also, on Easter, uh, remember that between the services there will be an Easter breakfast. So whether you come at 8 o'clock or 10.30, please join us for the Easter breakfast. Uh, also, the crosses you have, um, these were made by villagers in seven different villages in Tanzania. Um, and they are, uh, the money that is raised is given throughout East Africa to different missions and to different projects and so forth to help Christian mothers and sisters uh, not only in Tanz Tanzania, but also in Uganda and Kenya and other parts of the East Africa. So, um, those are uh, where they come from, and I hope you would take it home. And if you know, you can see that little loop, you can put string through it and wear it as a cross, or put something through it and then hang it on your revolver. Uh, so you can look at it each day and be reminded of our Lord's passion. Let us now sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, as it's printed.
In our gospel lesson for today, Jesus began by saying, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. The word ask means what you call for or what you desire. So Jesus is coming, we call upon him for what we desire, or call on him for what we need and will be given to us. The word means to bestow something to someone or to commit it to a person. Then he says, seek and you will find. Now what is interesting is that the Greek word behind the word that we translate as seek literally means to worship God. So first, we are calling upon God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, for what we need or what we desire. Then we seek to worship God, and He says we will find Him. We will find that we worship Him through that faith in Jesus Christ. And then He says, not, and it will be open to you. Uh, and that means just what it says literally, we knock on the door of heaven, we knock on the door of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and it will be given. Now, what is the importance of these words, ask, seek, and knock? Well, let us begin by my sharing with you the story of a pastor. A pastor tells the story of how when he was a young boy, he would pray to God for a motorized flying tiger model airplane. Now, this pastor grew up about the time I did. And if you remember, back in those days, we didn't have remote control planes. Motorized planes had two wires on them that were hooked to the plane and would meet in a handle. And so you had to uh, once you got an airborne, you had to direct them how they flew, and they could only fly as far as the wire was long. So they couldn't take off all over the place like a remote control plane does today. So that is what he's praying for. The plane he, des uh, he desired, he continued to pray for it for several years, and the plane never showed up. Not at Christmas, not on the birthday. So then he fast forwards his story to 20 years later, and he is a young pastor in a congregation. One Sunday in his sermon, he mentioned how we sometimes pray asking our Heavenly Father for something, and the answer is no. He went on to say, quote, we trust that our Heavenly Father knows best, and we move on. The following Sunday, as worship came to a close, the organist suddenly broke out, and off we go into the wild blue yonder. And as the pastor looked with surprise, the office staff came up the aisle, presenting him with a much more sophisticated version of a flying tiger model airplane. This one, of course, being remote control. The pastor went out that afternoon and flew his plane, and he said it was amazing, the thrill that he had. So then he fast forwards his story 15 years, and he's speaking at a conference in Florida, and he shares the story about the plane. The next day at the conference, a local man who had heard the story of the plane came forward and said he would like the pastor to have some. It was a patch, one of several he had, from the famous Flying Tiger Squadron of World War II. Now, if you're not familiar with the Flying Tigers, they were a group of American pilots who fought under the Chinese Air Force making strikes against Japan and China and Burma and other parts of uh, that area that became famous as a flying tiger. Well, this man had been a pilot of one of those planes in the squadron of the flying tigers. The pastor then concludes his story by saying he is waiting 
for the next segment of the story. A real parenting. And Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount that our prayers to God are not cold requests to a distant deity, to one who must be coaxed and must be appeased in order to listen to us. Our prayers are voiced in a deep, trusting relationship like that of a parent and a child. That is why we as Christians refer to God as Father. We don't just refer to Him as Mountain. We don't refer to Him just as Creator. We don't refer to Him as the Supreme of Force. We refer to Him as Father. Or, as it literally says in the Lord's Prayer, Dad, our Dad, who art in heaven, that is what the word Father in the Lord's Prayer really means. Aramaic behind it. Death. We do this because we have this close relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And just as we expect parents to do what is best for their children, we expect God to do what is best for us. Prayer. It's very much a matter of asking and receiving, but it is also more. It is seeking over time and fighting. We can be knocking at the door with the same request, not for a day, but for years. And because of that, some people start thinking that maybe God isn't listening to their prayers. That maybe God isn't hearing them. Well, one pastor who was talking with people about prayer and who were concerned about God uh, didn't seem to be answering their prayers, gave them this little outline to follow. He said, if the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you're wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, God says, go. Along the way, prayer is the means by which we discover the will of God for our lives. That will, which is always good, pleasing, and perfect. St. Paul reminds us about this will of God and how it is always good, pleasing, and perfect, in the 12th chapter of his letter to the Romans, in verse 2, when he writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. So, for this change to take place, we must pray. It begins with prayer, and it begins with us having a change. Do not be conformed to this world. That means do not fashion yourself after the world. Do not follow the same pattern as the world, because that will only lead you to destruction. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Transformed means to be dominated by Christ and the Holy Spirit which brings about a change. The word renewal means a renovation. It makes, means to make something different than what it was. As a follower of Jesus, we are made different. We are baptized into Christ's death, and we are baptized into his resurrection. We go from being a sinner in the hands of an angry God to a child of the Heavenly Father. We are renovated. Gene and I just finished the renovation of our master bathroom. It's still the same room. It's still the same door. We didn't expand it, but it's totally transformed. 
It is not what it was. It's nothing like what it was. That's what happened to us as we become believers in Jesus Christ. So God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good means to be profitable, beneficial, or suitable. Profitable here meaning not financially profitable, but spiritually profitable. Following God's will is profitable for us spiritually. Uh, pleasing, it means to be acceptable or satisfactory. So we follow God's will and we receive satisfaction from following that will. And it is perfect. That means to be complete. To be without error or mistake. God never makes a mistake when we follow His will. God never makes a mistake. The mistakes come when we resist that will. So Paul is reminding us that in prayer, we pray to His will, which is always good, pleasing, and perfect. It is what we would expect from a good parent and good parenting. It is a role that God fulfills. The poet, Emily Dickinson, at least in her poetry, struggled with the efficacy of prayer. That is the power of prayer to bring about results. She wondered in verse if God was listening when she prayed. So she wrote these words, quote, Prayer is the little implement through which men reach, where presence is denied they fling their speech by means of it in God's ear. If they hear, the sums of the apparatus comprised in prayer. There is an iffiness to Emily's prayers, a wondering if God listens. In another poem, she shares the disappointment that comes from a long-term prayer Apparently unanswered. Quote, there comes an hour when begging stops, when the long interceding lips perceive their prayer is vain. Thou shalt not is a kinder sword than from a disappointing God, disciple call again. Which of us? have not wondered at times as we pray if God is really listening. Who has not fatigued in knocking at the same door with the same request only to find silence on the other side? Jesus' teaching on prayer carries no such debts. He is utterly confident that our Heavenly Father hears our prayers and answers us. Sir Walter Ryan, the famous buccaneer and raider for Queen Elizabeth I of England, who spent a lot of his time tormenting and harassing the Spanish and capturing their ships laden with gold from the New World, had a habit of constantly coming to Queen Elizabeth with petitions. And so on this day, Sir Walter Raleigh came to the Queen once again with a petition as he had done so many times before. This time, however, when he asked, Queen Elizabeth seemed to be indignant and remarked, Sir Walter, when will you ever stop to approach me with petitions? So Walter Raleigh quickly replied, When the Queen stops granting my petition. So it should be with us. As long as the promise of God, our Heavenly Father, and Sovereign, that it will be given to you stains, we should pray without ceasing. This assurance is especially important for what we might call aspirational prayer. This kind of prayer 
expresses a deep desire before God that may take time before it becomes real in our minds. People in recovery understand aspirational prayer. As do people who suffer from long-term illness or people carrying a burdensome grief. In aspirational prayer, we pray again and again. We keep on asking. We keep on seeking. We knock again and again and again. Emily Dickinson to the contrary. Our long interceding lips do not perceive our prayer to be a waste of time. Some of you will remember Peter Marshall, the late chaplain of the United States Senate. One morning, as he gave the prayer in the Senate to open it for that day, he prayed these words. He said, Oh Lord, forgive us for thinking that prayer is a waste of time. And help us to see that without prayer, our work is a waste of time. This is our Heavenly Father. And the very act of asking again and again, and the very process of taking our aspirations to Him, we are confident we are being heard and that we will be answered. Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today, brings with it such confidence and aspirational prayer. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on his way to the cross, he is the Father's answer to his children's prayers over the centuries for the Messiah and Savior. Some in the crowd saw it exactly as it was. Others in the crowd, unfortunately, were filled with so much hatred for Rome and wanted Rome out of Judea that they were praying for a revolutionary leader, a man of violence and action who would drive Rome out of its borders. Many in the crowd, no doubt, were just at the beginning of the process of aspirational prayer, which would have them finally see Jesus as the promised anointing. Those who were Jews who knew the prophecy of Isaiah and Zechariah, they knew the cherished legacy of prayers for the coming of the Messiah and could not help but love. For us, who follow the one on the donkey, we know where he is headed. We see the passion before. Once again, we will walk the way of sorrows with him. We will listen to him pray deep and hard in the garden of his sin. We will hear his prayer for shouts from the cross. Jesus aspired not to greatness, but to service. Not to power, but to sacrifice. He came to fulfill that aspirational shout, Hosanna, a laying down his life for all. This, the Son of God, has taught us to pray just as he prayed child seeking an answer from our Heavenly Father. Today, as on that first Palm Sunday, all of our aspirations find their yes in Jesus of Nazareth. So we continue to ask, we continue to seek, we continue to know, aspiring in prayer to know Him, and to follow where he leads. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding in your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. As that you now
hand your attention to the Buddha. Oh, 
Hosanna, Son of David. Offering today is Debbie Cochran and Gus Singleton. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508. St. John's has an outreach store open Monday through Friday at 9.30 to 1, closed on Thursday. A food pantry open on Wednesdays, 9 9 o'clock to 10.45, and Rainbow Table every Friday from noon to 1, where everyone is welcome to share a meal. Our choir director is Vicki Perks. Our duty and our joy, 
we should all times and in all places give thanks and praise to our mighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ, who suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the choirs of angels of the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join it during an ending hymn.
Body of Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood, strengthen and preserve you in true faith and the life eternal. Amen. Concludes our 1030 service. Join us next Sunday, Easter Sunday, April 21st, 2019 uh, at 8 o'clock for 1030 service. Join us Thursday on Monday, Thursday at 1.30 or 6.30 for service or Good Friday at 1.30 or 6.30 for the service.